name is Bear Siragusa, and you are listening to the Hunting Hound Podcast presented by W Hunting Supply. countdown and everything yeah all right jared moss it has been such a long time since we've sat down and talked it's (laughs) awesome to see you buddy yeah you too man it's been a minute yeah it has been i was actually trying to figure out when the last time it was and i i couldn't figure it out i think maybe it was the last time you jason and i sat down together probably and that must have been right before christmas chris yeah in 2021 that long Holy i think cow, so no, because right I think, wow. yeah because I, th- I think actually the last time we sat down and talked was when i seem to recall it was when dan had disappeared into the mountains for days and days <laughs> and i was just like still sitting there kind of shell-shocked about the whole thing the whole thing <laughs> talking Holy to crap. you guys being like i don't know what the hell i've gotten myself into here what have i got with this dog what the heck and that's a whole story in itself. You need to do a that's podcast a... about that one day. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I do. I had the guy because Dan ended up, you know, most people know this at this point, but Dan ended up with um, a buddy of mine who runs who runs plots on bear. Right. Because it was clear that he was that Fox was not doing it for him. He needed he needed something bigger, stinkier to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was doing a great job with Fox, but at the same time, he was just like, if he could switch to something that he could brawl with, he would. Right. So he's, right. Uh, I actually did a podcast with a guy who's got him, got him now, um, John Steiner Bungen. Yeah. Who's like, yeah, he's like one of the greats over here uh, in terms of the plot hound, the plot Sweet. hound breed. Yeah. So he's doing doing well. Dan's still doing well. Uh, he's doing Dan is Dan, you know, he's still, he's still a crazy, he's still a maniac, you know, so he'll, (laughs) you know, if he, if you give him the opportunity to get in the face of something, he'll do it like he's all there. But if he's running, you know, a lynx or a fox or pretty much anything, and he crosses a fresh moose track because he got kicked in the face as a pup. Right. He'll he'll break off and go he'll off, and, off. You know. Gotcha. Try and get himself killed. Dang it. That's yeah, a, that's which gonna is, be a hard one to break, isn't it? That's a hard one to break, especially over here where you don't have the opportunity to shock him off of stuff. Right. You know, I'm not a huge fan of the shock collars for most things. I think they're it's real quick that people use them for things that they really don't need to use them for. Yeah. But at the same time, with the with the sort of life and death kind of thing, right. you know, hey, don't run across that highway or, hey, don't run after that thing that's going to stomp you to death. It, yeah, it, it would be ideal to have. I spent a week but, down in um, Texas working with James Ham, and he uses okay. the collar. He uses the e-collar like a scalpel. It was awesome to watch him work with pets. Cool. And he yeah. is on very low settings, like two, one, two, maybe two, three on a Garmin. So mm-hmm. super, super light. But man, he's mm-hmm. using that Garmin to, uh, it is awesome to watch. It's completely opposite of the way I use it. We teach everything on cord and layer the collar on top mm-hmm. of the chip cord, right? And his he's mm-hmm. flip. He's from day one, he gets a pet in for training and he's got the collar on. And he's using it in conjunction with the leash and collar the first couple of days. But I've just Mm -hmm. watched him just use it in a very low setting to, like, correct a dog's rollout on on a sit. You know how sometimes they'll Mm. put their heel, they'll roll out on a hip or they won't collect themselves properly. I watched him just Mm -hmm. use that collar on a momentary stimulus and then a little bit of leash and watch Hmm. that that guy correct very minute, I mean, very small things in a dog. I was, correct's the wrong word, just just manipulate or or yeah ask, guide ask yeah guide guide is the right word it was just awesome he and that was it was like a scalpel man it was like ching, ching, instead of this big blunt 
you know, hammer. It was like, right. I'm going to, I'm going to get you to move your hip in, collect your back end. There you go. I want you to bring your back feet this way. I want you to move your front feet this way. Dogs are super intelligent. That tool, I was just blown away how he used the collar, which is cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. Cause the, the people who know how to use it correctly. Yeah. Boy, it's, it's amazing. It's right. amazing. But, you know, there's so few of those people. And yet right. so many people have these collars. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, oh, boy. We were even talking about how collars have come a long way. You know, 25 years mm-hmm. ago, it was just like a cattle prod. It was like on and off. And it was just <laughs> right. a, jolt, a jolt of electricity. Like right. literally sparks, you know, like like electricity just shocking somebody and now it sure. can be as you know as as soft as like a tens unit that you use on your muscle just a stimulator just ding, yeah ding, ding, ding. and that's so they've come a long way they yeah. really have you know i before I, I was curious about it um and you know they're they're only allowed here for breaking dogs off of sheep sheep domestic livestock and then yeah. it's got to be through somebody who's been through the courses and blah, blah, blah. They are legally allowed to own it. And they're only allowed to own it, like to use it during this particular, you know, right. d- d- during, you know, the the courses or wh- or wh- whatever. Right. Um, but I was curious about it. I was like, you know, hey, I've heard a lot about these things. I'm curious about them. I'm just going to put this on my arm and just like, let me know. Let me know what it what the deal is. And the lowest setting, I mean, it's not more than like a tap on the shoulder. It's just like a tap, tap, tap. Hey, get it together. It's such a great, I mean, it's such a great tool. But then the highest setting is like, you know, yeah, end up flat on your face in the parking lot kind of a deal. It's like you just kind of seize up and flop over. Yeah. A lot lot of my clients, when they pick up dogs, I ask them to put the collar on the kind of the flesh in the palm of their hand right there. And a lot Mm. of guys work with their hands, you know blue collar guys they're they're working with their hands every day they can't even feel the first three or four settings they're just like no don't feel it yet don't feel it yet oh there i can feel a tingle so it's it's pretty cool it is pretty neat it's a neat uh that's a neat deal man in dan's case that would be yeah in dan's case that would be a tool that would be very effective oh you know make him car car literate so he understands that this isn't just punishment it's yep. a way to communicate and yep. then be like hey dude we're not doing that and right. man that would change everything for him it would be a get total game changer for him so um it would be yeah it's going to be interesting to see how how he develops um you know dan came to me when he was four or five months old right didn't really have the basic foundation of socialization and that kind of stuff right um so the first first months kind of went to that you know kind of went to getting him so that he was a decent canine citizen and then it was league even so there were things that he just could never i could never shake him of Hmm. you know that and he was so prey driven that you know small children small children babies cats right would just and the cats, it's like the cats, they'll learn to stay out of the way. I don't care. Right. You know, small children, it's, uh, I was a concern, but the babies thing was, was, was not okay for me. Sure. You know, cause it was where, where we hunt, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people in the areas where we hunt. Gotcha. And, you know, just like the thought of him, like, you know, finding some, small family out walking around right and you know just losing his baloney just did just, right just, yeah did, didn't work so where he is now there's no one you know there's like Good. let him out and there's like 100 miles to the next person so you made the right call so tell me about this new pup you got your boy's working this, with yeah he's doing a great job man like i, I went into that with this attitude of like you know certainly not not that the dog was going to be a throwaway in any way Mm -hmm. but that 
you know, I lowered my expectations. If it was my hound at this point, I would have had these, you know, expectations that, you know, I, I would have some level of control, some level of, you know, that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be biting. It wouldn't be jumping up. It wouldn't be hopping right. up on the tables. <laughs> you know, when I, when I called, it would come in, you know, uh, <laughs> That kind of stuff, you know, just kind of basic, basic stuff that I have an expectation that my hounds, regardless of the breed. Right. Are, th- 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 there's a minimum basic requirements. They don't need to be Rambo when they're six months old. I don't care about that. But I, I need to be able to get kind of contact with them. Sure. And, you know, the, like the whole time I'm like mentally preparing myself. I'm like, all right, this is this is going to be the first hound for an 11 year old. Right. I need to adjust my expectations of, you know, how fast this is going to go and also what that dog eventually, once you get to the point where you could call him as finished as he's going to be, what he's going to be capable of. Right. Um, and yeah, he's just like, Ivan, my son has just risen to the occasion to a, a ridiculous degree. And the dog is absolutely a really nice dog. Good. He's just like, he, he came to us well socialized, um, but you know, with no real boundaries. Like, you know, would would bite, would growl if you tried to take his food away, like stuff like that. At eight weeks old, and you know, I just walked him through the process, and he was so good about having faith in the process. My son, right? That you know, he was super, super consistent. Never, I've not seen him lose his temper once. Like he's been super super stable and consistent with the training and the dog has just turned into this really sweet really nice dog but with a prey drive that's just ridiculous good so it's it's going to be interesting to see yeah he came from um a buddy of mine over in sweden who imported um he imported a female he's actually got a couple of a couple of plots from steve moore that he imported before Steve died. Okay. And, um, so this dog Amos is, um, is a Ursus plot on like both mom and dad came from Steve. Cool. Um, how old is the plot now? Is he 10 months? Something like that. I don't even think he's that yet. He's, he's going to be, I guess he'll be six months, seven months. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Seven, seven months here, the 23rd. Cool. Yeah. So he's, so that's neat. Yeah. Just a baby, but you know, he's, they're having all kinds of fun together and getting out and getting him, you know, getting him working on some Fox from really early on you know, real early age, which, you know, ideally I'd just have him working on lynx and and bear, but yeah, the, the, the seasons here are quota seasons. So we get a certain number of animals that we can harvest. And then once they're harvested, like no, no question, no training seasons, no nothing. It's you're done. Right. So, you know, like the, the lynx season this last year, uh, there was so much snow that it actually went way slower than normal. Um, and you know, still was only like 20, 20 something days the year before it was five. Wow. That would you know, be really like hard the, to train. Even how would you even train that? That would be, that would be so hard, man. Like, yeah, we want to run yeah. links, but we only have a week to do it. That would right. a yeah, week a year. But, yeah. Yeah. That's not even practical. What's that like? <laughs> You can't make a dog in a you can't make a proficient dog in one week of the year getting to you, run. You a, you a, can't you no can't way. in in any way and and the 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 way that they do it, which is pretty interesting, but the way that they do it is they long line the dog, right, and then they'll walk like they'll wait for that snow and then they'll just walk tracks, so that gotcha. the dog gets it kind of ingrained that we're going to ignore all of this other stuff. And just focus on on this links thing, and uh, it which is cool. But at the same time, it's like you know you're you're walking your dog on a leash for 
a hundred miles before you ever wow. get to drop it. Wow. That's it just, I mean, like just yeah. doesn't seem, doesn't seem no. worth it to me in the sense that. No. You know, I, I, I mean, need something to run that's going to be more of a bit more, more, right? Oh yeah. 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 Fox season starts 15th of August and goes until the 15th of April. Very nice. Yeah. So, so much bigger so working, season it's going to be working amos with your son have you has that kind of been like some cool dad moments i don't know it has been I, yeah i oh, have absolutely my second oldest son has got this uh i don't even know mixed breed dog that he wanted whatever so but okay the last little while he's he's doing all the training and so he did really good for a couple months and then he weaned off for a few weeks. And then a month later, it's like, well, she's not really listening to me. And I'm like, yeah, you haven't put any time in the last two or three weeks. So she's going to blow you off on a recall. And he's like, right. Well, and then we did a seminar a week ago and uh, he kind of got to see some dogs doing some really nice work. And so at night, you know, the last few week, every night he's had her out and got her back on the long line and Good. getting cool. the caller out. And I'm like, cool. I, I've just not, I've been totally way back. Like you said, not, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not going to pressure you into teaching anything, but I think right. he saw that and he was like, well, my dog won't do that. It won't do that. Won't <laughs> right. do that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't even have to say it. I think he just saw it. And then he's out there on the long line. And I'm like, how's it going? He's like, well, I'm struggling with this. And I'm like, it's probably time we had the e car in, you know? Right. And he's like, okay, right. yeah. How do I do that? That's and cool. I'm like, it's time. I'll show you. So that's awesome. That's awesome. So there's I think been a that's couple part nights of it. Where, yeah. Yeah. That's great, man. That's great. So That's hopefully you, yeah, it's, you've had an opportunity. He, like that. I hope, yeah, you know, we've. I think I've I've tried to do it a little bit the same way that you you say that. You know, I've let him kind of, you know, hit his head against a wall for a little while. Yeah, and he'll come and be like, "Well, he's kind of doing this. He keeps doing this. You know, what do you yep. think about that?" And it's like, well, funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> right just so well, happens it just so happens that uh I, i've done this once or twice <laughs> yeah <laughs> i've got an idea how we can fix that yeah right exactly so it's like well you know gotta let them and that that's something that i'm not good at that i've really had to work with myself on Right. Is I, I like to be hands on when I see a dog doing something, especially when I know that with five minutes in five minutes, I could be done with it forever right. <laughs> without like banging on the dog, without being a dick. I, like I know that I could get in there and just be done with it. It would be the it. end of story. Right. And I also had to be real careful about like. Not letting him get super discouraged when, you know, I could walk out there. Because like he went on, va for example, he went on vacation for a week with his mom right? down to uh, his grandparents' house. Cool. So it's just me and the dogs. And I, that's like, it's pretty much all I do. Like, so while he was gone, I took, I took Amos and, and, you know, went for walks and just, I did the standard stuff that I do with my own dogs. And sure. And like, by the time he got back, I could like, you know, whistle him in and sat down before I let him go in the house and all right, go on in. and he'd go in and they'd sit down. I'd be like, all right, go and you know, what, whatever, just, it right. was just, he followed the same routine as all of my other hounds do. Right. And Ivan came home and was like watching this dynamic and was just like, man, <laughs> screw this. Like, <laughs> I've got, I've got to chase this dog down on my bike. It's like, this, this sucks. But, you know, rather than getting super discouraged, he just rose to the occasion. And, and yeah, like your boy, just, you know, started that's awesome. just kind of getting out there and doing it. So, it's right. Great, that, uh, it, that's fun. Yeah, it's, it's fun cool. to see. It's fun to see them take the initiative. It's like it's so hard to step back and watch him. Yeah, the, my little boy's dog, Kyson's dog got out and 
was ch- I don't know. She was just kind of running around the house and running around. And he's trying to call her, come here, come here. And she's looking at him going, nah, not today, bud. I don't want to. I'm not done running around yet. And it's so hard for me to not be like, oh, okay, let's fix this problem. You know, it's right. good. It's good. It's what, fun to uh, watch them finally go. I, yeah. But I said, hey, quit trying to. He was trying to kind of follow her, you know. I'm like, just come back over here. Just come over here and sit down. And he's like, but she's going to run away. I'm like, no, just watch. And so he comes and sit back by me on the porch. And all of a sudden, here comes the dog walking over. And I'm like, yeah, now when she comes by, slip the long line on. And now you're, then you're good, you know. Anyway, right. fun stuff. It's so much fun. It is so much fun. And it's, it's, it's also... I've experienced it a few times with the sled dogs where somebody new has come into the sport and has started asking me questions or asked for some kind of mentor, you know, right. Where, where it's made it so that things that I did sort of knee jerk instinctually. Yeah. It made me have to reevaluate why not only should I do those things, but why am I doing those things? Right. You know, when I reach out, you know, reach out a hand to, towards a dog. Why am I doing that? You know, what, what is it about that? You know, it, 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 and in each different situation where, you know, when I've got a dog running up to me that I think is about to jump up on me, I'll just put a hand out so that it doesn't jump up on me. But at the same time, you know, when I've got a dog that's not listening to me, I, I may put my hand out in a very similar way just to kind of get that dog's attention, not in a like, oh, sh-, you know, oh crap, he's going to hit me with that hand, but more right. in a, just like, you know, hey, a little bit of a, a flag, like, hey, focus right. in here. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. And it made me just have to reevaluate why I did some of the things that I did. And that's right. been really fun with the, with Ivan and Amos is that, you know, I've been, I've still not been doing this hound thing for that long, but I've been doing it long enough and it's sort of combined with the sled dogs that I've got things that I do. And it's, it's made me take a step back and kind of reevaluate why I do some of the things that I do. Um, right. And, you know, also really very closely, much closer than any other relationship or mentorship that I've had very closely watch what Ivan brings to the table and some things that he does that you know uh, naturally that i would I, you know i would i don't have those qualities sure and and be able to see the value of some of the qualities that he brings to the table that i don't bring to the table at all right um you know and and one of those things is that you know i will i will progressively get louder as i'm dealing with a dog you know you know, I'll say, Amos, come. If he doesn't listen to me, I'll be like, Amos, come. If he doesn't listen to me, you know, at that point, I, at that point, we're getting into kind of the consequence. Right. You know, uh, where it's like, OK, if you don't if you don't come, I'm going to adjust here. But there's going to be consequences for you blowing me off here. Right. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to haul off and wail on him or anything like that, but it's going to be it's it's not going to be purely a positive interaction anymore you know it'll end that way it'll end positively regardless but now we're going to have a conversation that he may not enjoy sure whereas ivan he he doesn't do that like he doesn't he he doesn't raise his voice the consequences are still there but he doesn't raise his voice so it's actually been really cool to see where i may need to go up an octave or two before a dog's going to, li- you know, before Amos will listen to me, I'll be like, you know, Amos, come. And they'll be like, hey, 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 hey come on. You know, whereas right. Ivan will be like, Amos, come. Amos, come. You know, he'll just <laughs> change the, he'll change the speed that he says things. And when Ivan starts to talk slowly, then it's, Amos is like, oh, crap. Yeah. He's serious. He's serious. You know? <laughs> Right. Which is really cool to see. And it's something that I'm really working on incorporating into my own dog training now is just be like, hey, you know, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm a big, loud guy in general. I, I don't. Sure. Um, it actually is not necessary. Sure. You know, 
I can. So it's it's been really cool. It's been really cool. Is this uh, is your son's dog? Is it a hunting dog or is it just like a, a family it's, uh, pet type it's deal? A part, it's a part border collie, part treating hound. So oh. he's got a little buddy that has his his dad does cattle and stuff, and so he saw one of these cool. pups. Like, yeah, I got. I kind of want one of those, and I'm like, wait a minute, we have like 50 dogs, and you want this one? A mixed breed, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And I'm like, you can have any dog down here. Which one do you want? No, that's how it is, right? It's like, yeah. Anyway, it's been good. That's cool. It's good. Yeah, it's it's a little different dog to, to train. Super smart. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Anyway, she's fun. She's she's got his number right now, but we're adding some tools that will good will help. <laughs> so it's good. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I've talked to a couple of people though that have said that um, that have had you know some accidental breeding between yeah. their hounds and a border collie. Or they've ended up with a dog that's just unbeatable. Yeah. You know, Doug, uh, Doug McMahon up in, up in BC, he was one of the first guys on the podcast. He talked about, he had a half border collie that he said was one of the best, best dogs he's ever had. Right. You know, she was like half border collie, half. I can't remember what he said, but she would, you know, was was as good as any of the hounds he had at that point. Maybe not as good at the trailing, but was right. just put so much pressure on the animals once they were once they were lifted, you know, that it, right. like I think she I, as I recall, he said she got badly injured just muckling onto a bear's butt as it was running up a tree and it ran like, you know, 50 feet up a tree before she let go. Yeah. I had I had a border collie as a kid, super smart, mm. and I didn't know anything at that point. Very athletic. They're they're they are great super breed. athletic. I watched some of the they are some of the guys that use them to work cattle and um, mostly cattle here. We don't have too many sheep around, but mm. they can be. I'm I've got a, a buddy that ranges cattle, and it's like I'll take one dog over to twenty you know twenty or thirty guys just because he can do. Oh yeah. He can do the amount of work that four or five men can easy, and he's not even breaking a sweat. It's like, right. you know, he can oh, bring him around and load him in the semi, and dog does all the work, and he sits around his horse and just can't, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, we got a little bit. Right. Yeah, so. That's awesome. Then when they're moving them, when they're moving the cattle, it's pretty cool to hear and talk about how they take them out on the range. And dogs are mm. super. Man, the more, uh, I don't know. I love dogs. I love canines. They're smart. They're so fun to work with, and they can be your best. Endlessly part. fascinating. Yep. There's always something to learn. I did. Yeah, there is, and it's one of the things where I talked to who did I, who was I talking to about this? It was I was talking to Stefan Kikta mm -hmm. about it. And he's a guy a little bit like me who's who's done so many different um, he's done so many different types of dogs. He's trained so many different types of dogs. He's done some border collies. He's done some um, bigger like uh, uh, I don't know if it was pit bulls or bulldogs. Right. Uh, he's done terriers, like den earthwork with terriers. And um, yeah, really, uh, really kind of interesting dude. He's done a bunch with beagles and, you know, is now doing the big hounds. And, um, you know, on the one hand, I sometimes wonder whether that makes it so that, you know, we're we end up being kind of jack jacks of all trades. Yeah. You know, where we never get really, really good at any one thing. But on the other hand, I've, when it comes to working dogs, I find that so much of it is, is transferable. 
to the other sure. types of working dogs. And you know, if the the sheep dogs are so fascinating. It was, you know, I'd just gotten into the sled dogs when I had the opportunity to get into the sheep dogs and had to say no because the sh sled dogs took all of my time and money and uh, right, you know, everything. But I think the day that I'm, you know, physically too beat up to follow, you know, follow my hounds in the mountains here is going to be the day that I switch to, to sheep dogs again. Yeah. And get back into that because That's that was, cool. that was a lot of fun that and they're so smart. It's such a different type of training. Different type. Yeah. Well, I look at the, the things I've learned this last year, you know, working with other trainers that, that train in different ways. And man, there's just, you know, adding the hounds in the last 10 or 12 years or whatever. And then there's always, it's cool. There's always something to learn. And I think you can, what's neat about it is you can transition. I, you know, we had a, we were at the seminar and one of the guy's wire hairs wasn't loading up in the truck real well. Still a young dog. I mean, he's only seven months and he's got one of those new trucks, you know, it's lifted off the ground a mile. It's, it's a pretty good jump for him to get there, you know, right. and we go over there and do some leash work and kind of show him how to make it a game and make it fun. And then if you need to finish it out, you know, use the leather collar and help the dog, you know, and I get a text from him two days later, guess who just jumped in the truck three times in a row? You know, it's like, yeah, that was fun. That was cool. That's, yeah. it's all stuff that you kind of learn from the different, different aspects of, of the, of the hound world. Absolutely. I was like, well, you need to just bring him down to the hounds and watch 20 dogs loading the truck all at once. And, and he's like, he'll be like, that's what we do. And just go, you know, it's fun. It's right. I haven't had a dog not loading the truck forever. Cause it's like easy. Just grab three or four hounds and be like, get in, boom, 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 boom. And then the third dog's like, oh, that's what we do. We just jump in. Cool. I can do that. Right. You know, and right. So monkey see, monkey do, you train. But here's a guy with, you know, one dog and he's like, I'm stuck on this. I'm like, anyway, a lot of, you can take a lot of stuff, you know, I, I was big anti pet stuff until this year. And some of the stuff that I'm learning on the pet side can make the bird dogs that much sharper, you know, it's like, sure. why not, why not, why not have a bird dog that can be sent to place at 60 meters? Why not? Why not right. be able to do, you know, why not be able to do all this off leash work? And it's cool. It's fun stuff. It is really interesting. It is really interesting. You know, I, when I got into the sled dogs, there was definitely this attitude in a lot of, um, with a lot of people that if you pet them, if you showed them too much love, it would somehow negatively affect their ability to work make them less tough yeah and that's something that i've seen has changed over the years both with sled dogs but also with the hounds that you know we're not in a situation anymore where you need to i feel like at this point that's been more or less debunked this attitude that if you train your dogs too much they're going to be somehow less less tough and you know if it any sort of remaining tendencies towards that that I had, which there weren't many, but were definitely kind of blown away by by getting to go over and hunt with my with Eric Partolo, yeah, over in Sweden. If you ever if you ever get over here, we're definitely going to go over and see Eric. <laughs> it's like ridiculous, man. I mean, ridiculous. I I'll. Um, yeah, I'll I'll check with him first, but I'll send you a video uh, that uh, I've got of, of his just his routine, and it's all right. about routines. I mean, he does the same thing every single time, and he's got the patience and the the wherewithal to do the same thing every single time. Right. Where you know he'll he'll say, "Okay, it's time to go inside," and all the hounds will come running you know, hounds and terriers and just like a pack of just like a pack bunch of, of different ages and everything. <laughs> and he'd be like, sit down. They'll all sit down and he'll call them by name. Be like, you know, Minnie, go in. 
and she'll run into the house right inside the door, turn around, sit down. It'll be like, right. you know, Hank, go in. And Hank will run in, turn around, sit down. I'll yeah. do that with all the hounds and then turn around and be like, you know, Minnie, go, go lie down. And Minnie will run over to her bed where she knows <laughs> she's supposed to be right. and lay down. Right. And I'll be like, Hank, lay down. go and lay down. And same deal. And he'll go through that with all of his dogs. And, you know, it's their hounds and terriers, which, I mean, are notoriously difficult to, you know, difficult to get a handle on. Yeah. And, I mean, it's just, it's, and they're all such happy dogs and they're so tough. Holy cow, those dogs are tough. That's cool. You, know, you put them on bear, you put them on whatever, and they're just going to go. They're, they're, they're insanely robust, tough, good dogs. And the terriers, same right. way. I, I cannot imagine that it is the case that they would have been somehow tougher if he just let them be like, you know, unruly maniacs. I right. Just, I can't, I can't see that. Yep. Yeah. I have seen, and with um, kind of on the flip side of the coin here, some of the dogs that during COVID didn't get socialized well with oh, people yeah. and other dogs. We had one dog at the clinic that, um, or the clinic, the seminar we did, that he was, he called me and his wife had called me and said, hey, my dog does this, this, and this and has super high anxiety when it's separated from my husband because my husband actually came home stopped working away from home has now worked remotely for 18 months and the dog is right. with him every minute of every day but she sleeps right next to the guy so they called me they said hey we're having these issues can you help and i said absolutely bring it down and i said we're going to work on the mind while the dog's here doing we're going to do the bird dog seminar but you're going to see that we're going to be working on every dog's mind while it's here anyway end of the first halfway through the first day the dog's already not worried about so much about him end of the end of the first day i'm walking the dog and it's not really even worried about the owner we're out right, doing right. stuff we're doing work we're doing heel we're doing whoa we're doing bird work whatever we're doing the stuff awesome. and end of the seminar the guy's like i think i'm just going to leave her with you and i'm like it's really what she needs is to be away from you for a period of time and realize right. that the world's not going to come crashing down and i'm going to put her to work anyway we took a really unbalanced in her mind, that dog was really unbalanced, super anxious, just borderline crazy. And we took mm. her back down to, you know, back to earth. It's like, hey, how are you now? And she's just happy and calm. And, uh, mm. but I have seen, I have seen dogs that have not been properly socialized, nor had they spent any time away from their owner. And so they're just like, the minute they're not right next to them, they're whining, they're barking. And even when they're with them, they're, they're, they are, if they want attention, flipping. they be, they become obnoxious. They're flipping their nose under the guy's hand. Yeah, they're yeah, barking yeah. at him. They're whining at him. And I'm like, guys, this is really simple correction stuff. Like, right. yeah, anyway, it, I've seen, I guess it's kind of become a term in the dog world. These, these COVID dogs that didn't have that opportunity to get out and be socialized properly, man, there's some. There's some real issues that, that oh yeah have created oh, yeah. created unbalanced. It's it's too bad. I mean, we get those dogs in at work all the time, all the time now, and it's just it's such a bummer. You know, where you'll see these well-meaning people and these right. dogs that have basically been their their way of checking out, their way of separating themselves from like the the chaos and the anxiety and the uncertainty of this whole pandemic right. crap. Yep. And then suddenly life goes back to normal, you know, to normal. And the dog is just like, holy crap, what has just happened? Like, why am I suddenly at a dog park with 80 other dogs? Like, I'm not yeah. equipped to deal with this. I can't process this. They're, they right, are. They're, so... they're over there going, duh. Right. Yeah. So like we uh, in a town not far from <laughs> us, uh, they as part of like their get, you know, get rolling after COVID deal, they they put aside some land and fenced it in and made a dog park. 
which I mean, dang, man. Yeah. The first few weeks that that dog park was open, it's like the dogs were not socialized. The humans weren't socialized. <laughs> like it, it got gnarly. It got hey, we gnarly. need this dog sewed up. Why? I went to the dog park. <laughs> oh, right. But I mean, like we got dogs in with lacerations and puncture wounds and stuff puncture, like that. Yeah. You know, I have a buddy who's a cop in Little Hummer. And he's like, oh, yeah, we had it got to the point where for the fur, we actually had to have a unit placed in that area at all times because we were they were getting called out for fist fights between you know co like the covid dogs are one thing the covid dogs owner owners totally totally whole nother level of crazy on. holy cow oh, insane <laughs> just like people who have not had to deal with other people at all for the last three years of just like suddenly up in each other's faces and their dogs are humping each other and it's just like it's it it got insane. So there were several arrests, fist fights. Like it, it, got, it got really, really like gunfight at the OK Corral over there. Holy it was really funny. It was really funny. That's nuts, but, dude. But yeah, I mean, what surprises me, and I guess this is the. I guess this happens when you've been doing something for long enough, I'm at this funny point in my career or my life as a dog person where I am fully and painfully aware of all of the stuff that I don't know. Sure. Like I wish there's so much that I wish that I knew. And it's the, it's that desire to learn more to the desire to do it. That keeps me in it. Yeah. But at the same time, things that I take, you know, it's a little bit like we talked about with our kids teaching them. There's things that I, I just do by second nature that it's it's unfathomable to me that somebody would even consider getting a dog without knowing how to do some of this stuff. Right. And, you know, it's it's. And, and I find myself needing to bite my tongue almost every day at work. <laughs> where it, it's like oh you had to go to the hospital because your three month old pup tore tore your hand apart that, yeah that sucks you know it's, that, <laughs> it's like what right you, my my favorite you'll you'll appreciate this one my favorite of the last say yeah covid time i got this call and this one was like i i need some advice i was like all right um, I'm here. What can I, what can I do for you? He's like, we have a dog. We got him a year and a half ago when COVID hit, we were home all the time and I, I don't know what to do anymore. Like my marriage is about to end. Whoa. And I was like, okay, wow. And I was like, what's like explain to me what's going on. She's like, the dog has so much separation anxiety that I can't leave the dog alone. If it's in the car, it tears up the car. If it's at home, I've got a bait, like a baby monitor and webcam and the dog is just losing its mind. Wow. So it's gotten to the point where I'll, you know, put the dog in the crate and then, you know, I got a speeding ticket, speeding to the store to get back to the dog quickly enough. And I was like, OK, I can understand that. And she's like, and I've got like a I've got like little kids and I don't know what to do. Yeah. And I was like, um, and she said, and this is affect like she said it again, this is affecting my marriage. And I was like, well, how is this affecting like can you can you be specific? And she said, Well, you know, our our son just turned two, and my we had finally the opportunity, my husband and I had finally had the opportunity to go on a date. <laughs> I was like, Okay, cool. And she's like, So, you know, we dropped the kids off with my grand with my parents, and then we went on a date. But I was keeping track of the dog. And I was like, how are you keeping track of the dog? She said, well, I put my husband's phone in the windowsill and I FaceTimed the dog the entire date. So he's like, <laughs> this guy's like trying to connect with his wife after, you know, however many years with small children. And the whole time she's like looking at her phone, like watching this dog completely lose it over facetime oh my gosh until her phone dies and she cancels the date and goes home <laughs> oh 
Oh, oh my goodness. Like, and I mean, I felt for the woman. I felt so bad for her. And like the, like I can see this is really upsetting her. And I'm like trying not to laugh over the phone. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, all right. Well, I I understand that you've got an issue here. I think the first thing you need to do is take down the webcam, and don't FaceTime your dog when you leave the house. Right. Like get a get a good crate. You know, get a gunner crate. Something something to the tune of that. You know. Right. And let the dog you're gonna need to let the dog adjust yeah you know these for these next couple weeks are gonna be rough the dog's gonna lose its mind but try and activate the dog before you leave yeah you know get the dog out get the dog moving go biking with it you know physically wear it out if you can but also mentally wear it out if you can right you know start doing like start doing obedience work and work that dog you know in your case it may actually be beneficial to work that dog past the point that i normally would work a younger dog sure. just to mentally wear it out so by the time you leave it's going to be like finally i can actually lay down here you know right and start having you know do you have any teenagers in your area that are happy to come and walk the dog like try start getting the dog used to other people and not just yourself and right. blah 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 and she was like, oh, this is this is great. Thank you so much. You know, I'm going to try all these things. And like a week later, I was like on the you know local law, the local classifieds. It was like clingy dog for sale. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I felt yeah. so bad for it. It's like, but right. it's, it's like and there's there's so many there's so many of them out there right now. It's, yeah. it's just ridiculous. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I think the need for training, need for help with training for the next while is going to be there. I, I see it in our business, the training. The training's really – um, the request for training's up quite a bit, and people need help. It's – yeah, see, like you said, things that seem simple and second nature to somebody that's been around dogs their whole life, to somebody that has their first dog or – their first dog that's been restricted like this through COVID is now it's like, how do I work through those social problems that I've got with my animal? And right. It would have been right. never been an issue in the past. Cause you could take him to home Depot, or put him in the truck and right. go for walks and do all this stuff. And now it's, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to me going back to the gentleman that had the dog dog's name, Maggie. He was like, mm -hmm. man, I, I'm running her two to three hours a day. And I'm like, yeah, that's going to help for so long. And then she's going to get used to that run every day. And she's right. going to be like an athlete. And if you pull the run away, she's going to have anxiety over not being able to get the dopamine hit from running. So sure. it's almost a double-edged sword. Like you're going to burn her down so you can have the rest of the day. And I'm like, hey, we got to engage the brain. We got to get her mentally. And it was fun to watch her when she came to the seminar. I mean – after the first 10 minute workout where we did the brain worked on mental stuff, you know, right. <laughs> Second day that dog slept for most of, if it wasn't working out in the field, it was under his chair asleep. And then he's like, I'm blown away about, we haven't done our three mile run or our two hour run in the last two days. But here the dog is exhausted because right. we're using the, we're working the brain, working the mind and teaching those right. You know, you take a working dog that wants to run, seek, find, and you're saying, sit, don't move. And it's like, uh, I have to really yeah. concentrate not to move. Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So with this particular dog, was he, was it mostly you doing the work with him or with the dog while he was observing? The, or was he doing a lot of it himself with sort first, of you guiding him? The first day was most of me. Well, the first half a day I was working the dogs and then we got the client. Then we got the people with their dogs in the field working them because you wow. know how a dog will respond. I can grab the leash and get a certain amount of respect and response from a dog really quick. Right. And the Instantly. dog's like, Oh, yep. this yep. guy's business, all business. Right. But then I put the leash back in the owner's hand and the owner doesn't do anything. And so the dog starts walking all over the owner. Yeah. So we get the owners out there doing the work and that's, that's where, 
that's where the, all the magic starts to really happen because they start seeing it themselves doing the work and they're like, hey, I'm actually getting this dog to woe or I'm actually getting this dog to stay. I'm actually getting him right. to heal properly. And then they get excited and I get to critique oh, them a lot so cool. and it's fun. On the flip that's side, cool. I, I, went, I keep referring back to this trip to Texas, but I consider myself a pretty good dog trainer and I went and met with James. And uh, obviously his training is completely different, but man, he picked me apart. Like this is command sergeant major <laughs> of the army, right? He's in the military for 31 year career. And um, so he's still, he's still in the military mode, you know, oh, 0500, yeah. you're rocking and rolling. And so, but What's he your was major he, malfunction numb nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like, that sucked. You suck. You know, what are you doing? That was stupid. I catch, I have, um, so a lot of my dogs know that ats means no. But here I am training mm -hmm. these dogs for pet people and the dog's on place and the dog goes to move and I'm like, at, and he's like, what the hell does at mean? And I'm like, well, good point. That dog doesn't understand, you know, so I got destroyed for about three days. I'm like, man, <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was really good for me to be like, be on the other side of the coin and be right. Be that. Wait, why are you doing that? Handle the leash this way. This, you know, give this leash direction this way. And, just a complete different way to train. Um, mm. But it was very good for me to be humbled for a minute and be like, well, I got a lot I can work on, you know? I, oh, yeah. It was good. It was good for him to pick me apart for a few days. So. That's good. And does he just do the pet stuff or does he do some of the hunting dog stuff as well? He just does pets. He did all mm. for like 17 years. He was in charge of all the detection and um, bite work for the. Oh, interesting. For oh, the government. So he was in cool. Afghanistan and Iraq for 13 of those years. And he was in charge of all of that over there. Some of the stories wow. he has are in crazy. But now he's retired from the military. He just does pets. Wow. He just does pets. That's gotta be that's gotta be a major adjustment as well to go from like yeah. the baddest of the baddest to right. like you golden know, doodle hey golden doodle miss Go miss that. right <laughs> miss Pomfrey's golden do golden doodle it's like exactly. really <laughs> he's awesome at what he does um i think the biggest reason he does pets is the money oh it, what he can do in that be, world yeah. Mm. yeah you know it, without without sounding like a complete jerk the pet world you can you can get paid you can be compensated for your time very very well whereas the hunting, the hunting right. they, they just you know he's like your typical client jared is a 30 to 40 year old man that wants his dog to be perfect in the field and pay the least amount possible to get there. Mm. Cause where my, most of my clients are stay at home moms or housewives that want their, with the dog every day, they're tired of the right. problems and the issues and they don't care what it costs. Let's just get the dog trained. So. Right. Completely different scenario. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Does it make you kind of consider doing a little bit of that as well? We have been training probably 10 or 20 pets every year for the last three or four years okay. just because of my the the bird dogs are in vegas at the dog park and they're like hey i got my australian shepherd here that doesn't do anything that your bird dog's doing like how do i get that how, how do i get that training and so they send them up to sure me. right so we've cool. been doing pets yeah. on and off for a while yeah i think yep. we'll add a little bit more of that just to just because there's a huge need for it i mean mm. people oh yeah I mean, right now, especially. Yeah, right now is right a lot. I mean, I think there's always been a need for it. And it's one of those things where, right. you know, that's always been the thing that's paid more than, you know, training. Training working dogs has never paid particularly well. Um, no, it hasn't. But, uh, you know, especially now where you've got, you know, was it was it the same there as it was here where the number of, like, the number of dog owners just skyrocketed yes. during COVID. Yeah, I just got yeah. done with the AKC kennel inspection actually yesterday. So I'm talking to this lady that's going all across the Western United States checking out kennels. And I'm like, hey, our register number's up. And she's like, oh, yeah. I said, did pets just blow up during COVID? And she's like, incredibly. Like, it's off the yeah. hook. Well, even our shelters were empty over here. Like, you people... People who wanted to adopt a dog couldn't even adopt one because they were all adopted out. Wow. wow. Of course, right now, I mean, they're back to being full, but they're filling the, back up again. Yeah, there was an 18 month stint there where 
people went and got a dog. Yeah, it, it, it drives me. That kind of stuff drives me a little bit crazy. Sure. Because, you know, it's like you look at some of these working dog lines where so much work has gone into, you know, creating a line of dog that can do what you want it to do, whether it's setters or pointers or, you know, wire hairs or hounds or border collies, whatever. Right. And then, you know, suddenly the pet market explodes and people just start asking these absurd prices for total garbage. Garbage. Yeah. And it just blows me away. Like they, there was a, there was a pug beagle cross <laughs> that sold for 80,000 kroners here. Whoa. 80,000 kroners is, is $8,000. Wow. At the worst of it. Because, you know, everybody who had a puppy litter, like we had a couple people, you know, we had a guy who had golden retrievers. Sure. And he had a litter of puppies. I think she got 11. He sold all 11 before they were born. Mm -hmm. and had a waiting list that was 300 people long. Holy cow. So if you wanted a dog, you needed to pay for it. Right. Like, So it was like they could ask for like a random mutt. Be like, well, you want him. 80,000 growers. Thank you very much. And they sold. I mean, they sold, they sold him. Sold him. Yep. Because they could ask, you know, it became a it became a hot commodity. Yep. And it's just it's. That kind of stuff drove me crazy. We're seeing that a lot with, with the crossbreed doodles. Taking a poodle and breeding it to whatever they're doing now. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, they're, the designer dogs went through the roof. And they were getting more money than I was for a purebred, papered right. German short hair. Right. Yeah, By like exactly. And then, like, what? Yeah, which is insane. You know, especially, you know, when they, they'll take these they'll take and break them down into smaller and smaller and smaller niches and smaller and smaller breeds based on the color. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we've got these, the two breeds that drive me the craziest over here are the cop. Have you heard of the copper dogs? Uh, uh. they call them Australian copper dogs. I haven't heard of them. And the only reason they call them Australian anything is because the guy that did, you know, did that first doodle thing was Australian. Oh, and the copper dogs is that sort of reddish copper color of the labradoodle, but they're not labradoodles. They're copper dogs and they can go for not like not even joking. That coloring can go. F they can be registered as copper dogs. Even if it's a full litter of a bunch of other colors of labradoodles, they will still go for twice the price. Crazy. Which is insane. Right. And then the newest thing here that we're seeing quite a bit of is, have you heard of the miniature American Shepherd? I haven't. That's another thing where they've just like smacked a name onto something insane where they bred, they bred Australian Shepherds to some small puffy breed pomeranian or something horrid right, horrid right where you get what looks like an australian shepherd it's just small small but you still get like you still get the throwbacks to the actual australian shepherd so people will buy an australian you know a miniature american shepherd is what they're called and be all upset six months down the road when the thing weighs 40 pounds <laughs> <laughs> It's just, it's, it's insane to me. It's, yeah. it's, it's insane to me. It's, what do you uh, have there? I've got a mini golden noodle and then it's like 80 pounds later. You're like, hmm, wasn't real mini, was it? Yeah. Wasn't real mini. Go. My, my favorite, uh, a very serious breeder of border collies here. Excellent, excellent dogs. Done a bunch of imports. Um, his neighbor had a Pomer or no, not a Pomeranian. What's what are those little black and white dogs with the real big ears and the sort of the, a lot of like feathers on their ears and 
uh, not a Pekingese, not a Pomeranian, but a. Um, it's not the Cocker Spaniels. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a toy breed. Oh yeah, I'm not up on that. Real small, like a little bit bigger than a Chihuahua type of a deal. Gotcha. And so his neighbor had one of these that would come over and just sort of like squeeze through the bars of his kennel. Oh, boy. And harass his females in heat. Right. But, you know, his females were 35, 40 pounds, and this dog was six or seven. So he was like, man, whatever. Right. And what ended up happening is they what they think happened is the only reasonable explanation that they can have is that the females got so tired of this dog that they just started to ignore him and went to sleep. Gotcha. And what they think happened, because he they came in with a litter that was half these small, like clearly a mix between these super small dogs and border collies. Border collies. That they think that the uh, this little dog, because he was way, way too short to breed the female while she was standing up, that he actually managed to breed her while she was asleep. While she was asleep laying down. <laughs> Holy cow. Wow. And the guy was so frustrated because this is a well-established breeder and kennel of, of border collies right he said he's never had a litter that was easier to sell <laughs> than than these pups asked full price for him was just like mm. mixed yeah. between these two things and people were like that's interesting i'm willing to shell out whatever two thousand dollars for them. right I'll this take insane insane mix of crazy yeah whatever whatever it was i'm trying to remember what the name of the breed was but I'm, it's it'll come to me later but yeah but yeah, no, people are, people are crazy, but how was, um, how was your season with the hounds? It looked like it went pretty well. Yeah. Winter was great, man. Um, hmm. we were able to get a lot of dogs on a lot of cats. Cool. I didn't have any clients in for training and I didn't guide this winter. So I just hunted my own dogs and oh wow, that must did, be nice. I did some training. I took on some three or four hounds for training um okay for the public but it was good it was good we got got we got i've got three young dogs coming up um mm -hmm. lot lost an older dog josie finally passed away and oh wow the the was she the she dog that was my, standing on that butte with that uh face to face with that uh no that's Haley. And line Haley, a few years ago okay Haley's waist she's slowing down too she's hitting that nine ten years old and she's just this winter, I was like, yeah, you're finally losing a step and the younger dogs are out, out ahead of you, you know. She's, um, yeah, it's crazy. Kind of my whole pack that six years ago is now, you know, when you and I first started talking, a lot of that pack, the lead dogs in that pack are past. I I placed another, I placed Beretta with a gentleman in New Mexico who's trying to start his pack of hounds and i'm like you know what she's losing two steps in my in my pack and but she could start your pack great you know and so i got a lot of young dogs and the pack dynamics all changing but i we've had a really good season really good season got a lot of cats and got a lot of good dog work in we had a lot of snow that got tiring I mean, hiking to trees and waist deep snow got, I didn't, or I didn't even want to do it. Yeah. I was like, oh shoot. So, but I got to listen to a lot of good podcasts too. So I've enjoyed, I like, uh, I really like the sessions you have with Becky. I think you guys do a really good job of articulating some concepts and it's fun oh, to I hear all that. their, all their fun stories that are going on and they're pursuing cats and living on the living living the life on the ranch whatever they do but yeah now becky's becky's a hoot she's such a she's such a character um and she's so deliberate about everything she does that it's really interesting to talk to her because you know unlike some of the, you know i can talk to some people and some you know you'll occasionally get the well why do you do that and they'll be like well that's how it's always been done whereas with Becky, I can ask you, well, why did you do that? And she'll be like, well, and have, you know, within seconds, give me this like 
really detailed, deliberate, yep. considered answer, which I really appreciate with Becky that she's able to do that. Um, yeah, she can, art, she can bring into words a lot of the things that you're thinking and you do, but you're like, I don't know how to describe that to another person. She does well. With right. That. She does. She does. So she's a great, she's such a good guest and she's such, she's also such a good storyteller. Right. That, I mean, you can listen to those podcasts and it'll be like, you know, I'll, I'll ask a question. And it's just, sometimes it's just like throwing a match onto a fire. Right. It's just, it's just like, it'll get her going and she'll just, there's so much great. She's yeah. She's, she's funny. I always, I always enjoy my conversations with Becky. She cracks yeah. me up. Yeah, you guys are an hour and a half in, and it didn't. It went by like that, you know. It's just, yeah, it, it's, it's fun to listen to those. Those episodes are good. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, she's one of the, uh, she's one of the good ones for sure. Sure. Yeah, for I sure. enjoy that. The the hounds that you have in, uh, that you've brought in, that you're training for other people, are they mainly from your own line of dogs? So you know, like no, completely different lines. So I How had, does that um, work in terms of your your overall pack dynamics? Bringing in a dog that maybe has a little bit of a different, some different, brings some different qualities to the table. So we had two dogs in from Montana for a gentleman. He he sent them down to me for a month last season. No, two months last season, and they did they did okay. They did you know we got them trailing, we got them treeing. They saw a lot of game. They were good. He, he sent them back down this winter, and they became monsters i mean the one little dog he's got is going to be a really nice lead dog she's freaking awesome in fact i got to where i was starting tracks with her and or if i cut two tracks in one day i'd start a pack with you know start five or six dogs and i would use one of his dogs uh to start that she he's got two really nice hounds now he's um you know we've put six months of work into those dogs but they're they are firing in fact i I drew a fall bear tag and I called him and I said, Hey, if, uh, you know, if you want to put those two to work this August, let me know. Cause I've got, I've got a tag and I'll be hunting hard and you can burn, through, you can burn through a dozen dogs real quick. You know, August is hot. It's too hot. It's, it's really, we should be hunting the bears in September, October, but the division of wildlife here gives us August. They cut it back to August this year it'll be borderline too hot. You know, we'll have to be at 10,000 feet looking for a bear because the low country will be way too hot to run dogs. So those two dogs have done awesome. The other gentleman who sent me a couple of dogs from Colorado, um, complete different story. Those dogs were raised in the house. You know, they didn't really see, and they didn't see enough game in their first year. So the female, is the fee he sent me a male and a female the female is turned on she's starting to tree she's starting to trail but it has taken a considerable amount of work to get those dogs to leave my side and go and hunt i mean a lot a lot of work more way more than i anticipated you know so genetics genetics are super important it's I think I give the example of when I first got my first bird dog, um, her name was lady paid 25 bucks for her out of the classified ads. And I turned her into a nice bird dog, but I put tens of thousands of hours into that little dog. My next dog I bought for considerably the amount of more money, but had the right genetic makeup. And I put one tenth of the work into him and he was twice the dog she ever was. So, you know, it's, it's it's a hard conversation with with the other gentleman from Colorado. He he understands and he's like, but these dogs are pets first, and my wife's not going to let me, you know, rehome them. They're not going to go anywhere. I'm like, well, no, we got a lot of work to do. And the male the male is a little bit slower than, and he actually, I don't know. We were in the rocks hunting one day, and he just came back limping confirmation he's got a confirmation issue in his back legs his back legs are just like this straight there's no there is no pain and so i took him into the vet and the vet's like as straight as his back leg is he's gonna have probably tendon issues his whole life he was talking about the tendons that go across the knee on that mm -hmm. like the x pattern there and 
He's yeah. like, yeah. that could slip. Lig ligaments. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Mm. Yeah, he's like, those could slip. They could, we x-rayed the bone structure around there just to make sure there wasn't a fragment that had chipped off, you know, like the bone. The tendon had actually, anyway, long story short, that dog went home early, but the females become a, nice, a pretty decent little hound. She's starting to figure it out, but it's taken months to get there. So, Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that is what you're buying when you buy quality genetics is, you know, there was a, I read a book by a guy. I didn't, didn't agree with a lot of what he said, but one thing that he said that, that's, that resonated with me, it was Raymond Coppinger. I've heard the name. Yeah. He wrote a book called Dogs where he, he sort of had this theory. He's a, he's a, he is a researcher at, I want to say Berkeley or Cambridge. I'm not, I can't actually remember which one. <clears throat> but he did a lot of research on, on dog behavior and dog genetics. Yeah. And, you know, he did, he had some sled dogs that he was working with and some gar uh, like livestock guardian dogs that he had and then some herding dogs. Gotcha. And, you know, wanted to kind of figure out to what degree behavior was learned sort of nurture versus nature mm -hmm. and found that, you know, even if he took an entire litter of herding dogs away from the mother and put them with a sled dog, it didn't necessarily mean that they were going to be any better sled dogs. Right. You know, they weren't going to, they weren't going to not function <clears throat> in what they were bred for. But he said on the flip side, he could take a Pomeranian and teach it how to herd. Gotcha. It's just he doesn't have enough time to do that, right. <laughs> you know, or he's he's done it and he doesn't need to do it again. Right. And I, you know, I, I think that's. You know, that, that there's there's something to be said for that, you know, with like that, that VP dog that I've got. Right. That's not anything I'll ever do again. I'm glad I did it. I'd learned a ton sure. from doing it. But that's not anything I'm ever going to do again. Right. Because it's it's like you said, you know, I got her for nothing. The genetics were absolutely there, but she got such a off start that I spent years working on undoing the damage that had been done. So by the time I had her working close to how I wanted her to work, you know, it, it's like you said, you had 10 hour, 10,000 hours of work put into that dog. Right. You know, almost any dog is going to be, it's going to start to show improvement after 10,000 hours. Right. Right. You know, but it's, it's why, pe it's why I always say to people that they really should consider buying from a reputable breeder that's doing the kind of things that you want to do because, right. You know, you may not, it, it really depends on what you, you put into it. You may not get any better dog than the other, than you otherwise, you know, than you would have if you bought a, you know, something from the classified ads for $25, like you said, or like for free, like Vitby. But you're going to use a 10th of the time. Yeah. Yeah. You're stacking the cards. There's, there's just no way. Yeah. And I think that's been, uh, yeah, that conversation's happened a lot. You and I have mm. talked about it. You've talked about it with lots of your guests. I mean, mm. it's, Breed, breeding yeah it's kind of the foundation for everything it's going to determine w at the end of the day you said it with with your son um i need to check my expectations on what that hound is going to be at its peak right mm -hmm. like when it's finished his level this dog's level of finished work might be completely different than this other dog's and I really feel like the genetics have a huge play into that at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, not only just working a track or treeing ability, but physically being able to do the work, right? Confirmation and built, built, yeah. built to last 15 years, not absolutely, to, you know, three to right. four years and the dog's falling apart. This young dog's a year old and he's already having issues. It's like, I don't know, you know, I'm telling, I'm telling the gentleman, yeah. 
you've got a, a, life, a lifetime of issues with that. Yeah. Right. Right. And then you end up in kind of a conversation where it's like, you know, I could continue putting the 10,000 hours into this dog, but right. what is that dog's body going to look like after 10,000 hours? Yeah. Yep. And that's, that's a tough conversation to have. It's, it's, you know, I've, I, and I, I talk to people, the confirmation thing is something that people do not pay enough attention to, even in breeding. Right. For my, for my, for my likes. Sure. You know, I, it, you know, they've, they've got all of these field trials and things over here. And there are some field trial champions that I've looked at and been like, not in a million years would I breed to that dog. Who did that dog? Yeah. Because it's got some confirmation issue that is just going to come back and bite you. There was a dog, there was a dog in the, uh, in the dog mushing world named Pluto. It was one of the all time greats, like it, unbeatable when he was alive, unbeatable lead dog right? at the open class sprint, which is, you know, running flat out for 25 miles, like insane level athlete. Right. He had a confirmation deal that never, ever bothered him, but he passed it on to his kids. Yeah. But everybody bred to this dog because he was the best of the best of the best. Right. And it led to 10 years of just mediocre garbage. Yeah. Trying to get away from this weak front end where it was just wrist issues all over the place. Oh. It, was, it was ridiculous. The degree to, uh, to which this one dog, despite being perfectly bred on paper and had a had a you know list of accomplishments as long as my arm right was still just absolutely not a dog they should have been breeding to and in hindsight it's obvious but like that was they were just finishing up the sort of cleanup work uh when i got into the sport you know they were still like people would still like back way off and be like oh pluto no 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 right because the front ends were so bad. <laughs> so bad. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's something where, you know, when I when I'm looking at when I'm looking at potential hounds to breed, I don't and it you know, even with my own with my sled dogs back when I was breeding them, I didn't make exceptions. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, he's really well built, but his head's not totally there. Or, well, he's, he's, he's got this confirmation issue, but he's insanely hard headed and willing to go and willing to, like, I wouldn't breed to that dog. Yeah. Which actually like upset people. People would be like, well, why aren't you breeding to this dog? I'd be like, I don't want to breed to that dog. That dog has a head issue or it has a confirmation issue. Right. And, you know, I got the reputation for being arrogant and that was not, not, it was not the reality. I didn't think that I had, I didn't think that my dogs were any better than anybody else's. And I never got into my own head where I, where I bred only what was in my kennel because my dogs are the best or my dogs are the only thing out there. That was never the case. It was just that my, I was looking for specific things and was not willing to flex on those things. Right. And those are things that w wouldn't, you know, wouldn't necessarily have made a difference to anybody else. Yeah. But at the level that we were performing and at the, the, the level that we were training and where I was geographically, what I had time for, you know, all of these things, it all, it all played into what dogs I bred. Sure. And it's really interesting to me in, in that sense that, you know, coming from, a uh, you know, the, the Alaskan Huskies, it's a mutt. Yeah. And yet, you know, I'll talk to these breeders of purebreds, purebred hunting dogs here and just be like, we're not on the same page at all. Like my requirements were so much more stringent. Yeah. Than theirs are not necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying that I was, I was a better breeder. I don't believe that I was, but it, it, it kind of, it, it took me a long I'm still, I mean, heck, I'm still, 
I'm still looking. I honestly believe the next hound that I'll get, if I can ever get a dog from Eric, it's probably going to be, that's probably going to be what I do. Yeah. Because he's done, he's done that work. Right. And, you know, the making the, making the excuses for, well, they're soft headed or, but they're built really well or, well, they're, you know, they've got weak back end or, uh, a back that'll build up arthritis or whatever. It's, it's it's just one of those things. I just don't understand why you would make excuses. Yeah. Yeah. I will say from the breeding side though, um, mm. one, one thing is there's never the perfect dog. <laughs> That's true. E- even though you're trying to, and even though you're trying to, you know, confirmation or then you're working on, like you're saying a dog that's really strong headed or a dog that I see, I saw it with our dogs a little bit. We got really hustler, hustler bred cause we wanted the confirmation and the temperament. And all of a sudden we mm-hmm. started losing a little bit of the retrieve. So I had puppies that were the retrieve instinct wasn't as high as I wanted it. Like, yeah, they'd go okay. out and pick it up and a little bit of coaxing, but I was like, man, we're losing the retrieve. So then I had to go grab the no Mars line and bring it in. And it's, it's a, it's, you're always trying to improve, you know, but you, yeah, yeah, you think you got it dialed and then you're like, crap, we're losing a little bit of this. So then I have That's to bring the thing, that in, it? right? You know, so it's, yeah. it's a balance. It's, uh, you know, trying to put that perfect recipe together. You're all, you've always got to be trying to improve just a little bit. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. And, and uh, that's the main reason why I never got bogged down in my own kennel. I was always looking for dogs yeah. that would bring in qualities that I was looking for. And it made it, you know, and it made it so that there were things that I needed to sacrifice. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted the ability to break trail, like break, you know, to, to make a trail in deep snow, right. Which meant that I needed a longer back. I needed a longer legged dog, which meant that I needed some weight to the dogs, but they needed to be not heavy to the point where they were going to break down their front ends. Right. So I ended up with very tall dogs, which, because of their long backs, didn't have that top end speed. Yeah. So I sacrificed some speed at that top end right. to get that low that low gear. Right. And, you know, a lot of people where, you know, they, they're training in areas where they have access to trails that are groomed all the time. They, they don't need that. So my dogs, ne- you know, would not have fit in right. necessarily. They, they would have had major flaws for somebody else. But it was specifically what I was going, going yeah. for, and even then I had, you, if it was about not having the perfect dog, but about you know having, you know having the dog that fit me had the, you know where you, you kind of make the sacrifices where right, that's a really good you know, point. But, but do, yeah, but being aware of it, you know. Yeah, yeah, you're you're spot on because what what I need or what I'm trying to produce could be completely different than what you are trying to do. I mean, we have. That's, that's one thing I tell a lot of clients that call me, Hey, I, I've done some research online. I think I want a German short hair, you know, and da, 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 and this is why. And I try to explain to them inside the short hair breed, even now today, it's like taking a paint roller and rolling it across the wall. You've got right. breeders inside of that paint roller that are breeding for very specific traits in yeah. the lab world. And, and even, so you have, you know, breeders that are like you're saying, hey, I want these are the these are the abilities and things that I have to have in my dog da, 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 and go down the list. And so mm-hmm. it's so important now to find the breeder that's breeding the dog that you're after, because that's that's, that's right. There. right. Putting those two together. And at the end of the day, the client's happy. The dog's happy. You're happy as a breeder. Yeah. Everybody's everybody's happy because we're all wanting okay. the same end product right so you're Absolutely. that's a really good point i yeah that's a good point to say is um find the breeder inside the breed if you've looked at the breed in general even get really finite you know get really narrowed down on what attributes you want what personality traits you want how big mm. a dog you want you know like you're saying get it really specific and then when you find that breeder get on that guy's list and be like yep this is, you know, this is what I'm after and I'll be patient and get that instead of running right. to the next one and being like, well, I found this dog on Craigslist or whatever. And it's like, well, just because it's a German short hair doesn't mean you're going to get all of these qualities that you're after. Right. 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 Absolutely. That's a great and, point. You know, it's, 
but it's that specific point that gave me the reputation for being an arrogant shithead. <laughs> <laughs> Not willing to compromise on certain things. Yeah, no, it's... Well, I, I got offered the, the, the thing. It was a very public thing, too, which was I, I, I should have been more aware of where I was and kind of the people I had around me and stuff like that. But I was a very a well-known guy who I have a lot of respect for. He did a breeding where he took a very, very good dog from a guy named Lance Mackey, who was just one of the best dog mushers of all time, and bred it to a very good dog from a guy named Martin Boozer, who was also one of the greatest dog mushers of all time. And these were both dogs off of their winning teams, like as good as, genetically as good as you possibly could get. Sure. But... Lance had these bigger, heavier coated dogs that would trot. They would trot and they would go for days with, I mean, virtually no rest. I mean, it was amazing. They were endurance athletes to the, I mean, to the highest degree. Whereas Martin's dogs, they were short coated, heavily muscled, um, you know, Nicely put together, nicely built, you know, no issues there. But his deal is he would he would gallop from checkpoint to checkpoint and then put that rest back into the dog so that they would recover and recuperate and then gallop to the next checkpoint. So it's a different way of approaching these sort of extreme long distance races. Sure. To the point where the dogs could have been different breeds. Gotcha. They were just they, they were not similar in really any way. Yeah. And that breeding had no, in, I had no interest in that breeding. I just like less, less than no interest in that breeding. <laughs> I, I knew both, both genetically. I knew both dogs. I'd run dogs. I'd run them both. And I knew dogs from those kennels. I knew what they brought to the table. And I knew that, you know, that to combine those two, do two dogs, it would be like combining... It'd be like combined. I mean, they're 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 as different as a German short hair and an Irish setter. Setter, sure. Like that's f morph, like morphologically, that that's how different they are. Gotcha. Yeah. And to combine those two things and expect that that's going to bring the best qualities that's of both of those dogs, to the it's just it doesn't work. Doesn't work that way. Yeah. I, I have no faith that that's going to work. And I was, you know, young and young enough and dumb enough to say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's in, that's insane, and then like wondered why everybody thought that I was why you were an opinionated yeah jerk <laughs> yeah so quite interesting but yeah it is it's and you know endlessly interesting this whole ugh, this whole dog thing endlessly interesting dog men are good people lots of good stories I think they are there's a lot lots of good stories. stories yeah lots of good background. Yeah, and a lot of people come into it from different, such different backgrounds. Like if we were all the same, basically the same guy, it'd be super boring. <laughs> but it's so interesting talking to people because they come from, yeah. It's like how they got into the the hounds or the bird dogs or you know, the working dogs in general. It's just the avenues that they, that, it took for them to get there. So fascinating. Right. It's really, I, really interesting. I had one of my mentors up for lunch on the last day. I said, Hey, why don't you come up? And he lives about an hour and a half away. He's like, I don't have dogs anymore. I'm out of that game. And you know, I'm retired. I'm like, just come up for lunch, man. You'll enjoy the atmosphere. You'll just enjoy the people. And you know, we're fixing right. Dutch oven potatoes and chicken. It'll be a really nice lunch. And then he came up and he was like, man, this was great. You know, this was a great afternoon. I get to watch you out there and you're busting your butt. And I'm sitting in my camp chair and just kind of hanging out and listen to the dogs and, and right. listen to all, you know, all the cool, you know, listen to some of the people and their stories and just be around people. And, uh, it was That's really awesome. Cool. He called me, he called me and well, he actually texted me the next day and he's like, you know, 
you know, he says, as you know, the real benefit of dog training is that it encourages men, women, and boys to be better. And he's like, mm. you know, don't forget that in your interactions with all these people that you're, and I, and I think he nailed it on the head, man. I think the dog world, dog people are really good people, you know, at their core, mm. they've got really good hearts. They have, they care for animals. They care for, they want the best for their dog or their horse or whatever, you know, they love animals. They love, they have a really good heart and I, it makes me grateful to be a part of the dog world. Cause a lot of the people I like, it's like you, man, you're completely across the, you're completely across the other side of the world. And here we are having a right. great conversation about dogs and dog, right. you know, what, what's going on in your dog world and what's happening in yours. And dog people are good people and they have, really good hearts and good intent. Yeah, and, uh, well I think said. we can influence, you know, if you're, hopefully if you're listening to this podcast, you've got a dog and you're trying to do something. And I think that's, you know, kudos to you bear for picking the mic up and keeping, keep going forward and keep, keep having the conversations and keep talking about it. Cause you just never know who's going to jump in and listen to that. And then it's going to help them. It's going to give them one, one little golden nugget out of that conversation helps them dog helps their dog helps them be better and then you know that's all positive then then we're helping somebody right well i appreciate that you know it's it's honestly it, you know one of your I, i'm gonna be brutally honest right now and say that yeah. I, I didn't get into the podcast with any desire to make the hound world a better place or you know lee or anything like that there were two motivations for me doing the podcast at all. The one was that I, I liked the idea of having an audio rec uh, an audio archive. Sure. So this idea that, you know, my my great 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 grandkids will theoretically be able to be like, hey, I wonder what old great 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 granddad sounded like. And they'll be able to listen to this. And it may be totally foreign to them. Right. But it, it appeals to me that they'll be able to hear my voice. But the other thing was exactly as you pointed out that that the, the dog people, hound people, you know, working dog people, really dog people in general, they're such good people that they're the type of people I want to have a conversation with. Yes. And they're also so motivated, and I'll put myself in this category as well, so motivated to learn and do better for their animals. And that was a major motivation for me to do this podcast, not because I had anything to add, anything of value sure. that I felt like I had to add to the soup, but because there were so many people that I wanted to talk to, right? to just for the sake of trying to do a little bit better for my own dogs. Yeah. And, you know, it's been such a positive experience and getting to know people like you and, you know, people like Becky and Jason and, and you know, right. Bob Plot and Eric and, you know, all of these people that have reached out to me over the years. And it's, it's been, you know, cause it's been a minute that we've, we've been doing this for a little while. Right. And it's been so positive and not only have I benefited from it just personally and socially, especially in this, these Corona times. Right. But my dogs have benefited from it enormously. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm 10 times, I'm not much of a houndsman, but I'm 10 times the houndsman I would have been if it was just me farting around in the woods with no feedback whatsoever. You know? Exactly. Well, and I listened to some, you know, I, I listened to you and Mark talk or uh, you and Becky talk or one of your guests. And I'm like, oh, cool. I could add that. I could try that. That's a good way to look a different perspective, a different point of view. You know, it's, it's like James made the comment the other day to me. He's like, you got to have six or eight ways to train the exact same thing. Cause that some dogs aren't going to respond to one method. You know, he's like, you really need to have six to 10 different six to eight was his, if you got six to eight different ways to train heel or six or eight days to change sit, you're going to be able to train or help just about anybody, any dog, you know? So keep it, keep it going, man. It's, it's, it's cool for me to also hear you interviewing um, people that I never would have known even you know, had hounds or had dogs and hear their story. And that The podcast platform is awesome because it allows you to do that. And both of you and I are sitting in the comforts of our home and not having to 
get on an airplane or to, to have that conversation. So, right. Right. And the other thing I like about the podcasts versus, you know, like on uh, like video interviews and things like that, those are great too. But is that you can just have it on in the car. Like it's just like radio. Right. Like you don't have to be sitting down. You know, we've been going for, I mean, we talked for probably 40 minutes before we started and now right. we've been going for an hour and a half, which is unbelievable that it's gone that fast. You know, it's like, it's going to be so easy for people to sort of absorb you know anything of value that we talked about which uh, you know is is quite a bit i think yeah without needing to stop their day right and watch an hour and 35 minute video right you man know, I've, I've, plugged, I love I've i love the podcasts yeah i put my earbuds in and i'm out there training and i'm listening every day i'm a podcast junkie so yeah it's yeah, me too it's a great <laughs> platform <laughs> but like you said you're multitasking you're out you're doing your you're doing your thing and and you're still uh, getting some positive in, you know, so. Yeah, cool. no, it's 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 true. I can. Uh, it, it's amazing. People people say men can't multitask, but I can hear what my dogs are doing a mile away. I can hear whether they're running trash over the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> over the Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah. 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 I hear yeah. you. You know, there's a certain but, bark or there's well, a certain dog with a certain voice. And you're like, oh, that's my dog. I need to tell him not to bark anymore. Yeah, exa exactly. You're like, oh, they just that pup just switched to roe deer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'll be right back for no reason whatsoever. Right. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I uh, thoroughly well, I appreciate you coming on, Jared. Yeah. It's, it's always such a good time to talk to you. It's been way, way too long. And I know we both had a bunch of uh, bunch of stuff happening in life the last year and a half. And yep. It's good to see you guys. It's good to see you and good to see yeah. you're doing well. And Same. That uh, both of our families are doing well. And it's, yep. uh, yeah. Good to see. Good to see that. Yeah. There's some resili resiliency in us as well as our hands, right. I guess. Right. Mm. Yeah. Good to talk, man. Good chat. It was a good, good one. I, all right. I appreciate you, brother. Talk soon. Man, I love that sound. <laughs> <laughs>